Hello, thank you. Thank you for staying and for um, staying to, and inviting me to talk. So yeah, I was quite nervous when I put this together. My name is Jess. I work at the Center for Plastic Electronics in Imperial College London, where we're working with new materials that combine the electronic properties of something like silicon, but the mechanical properties of something like carbon or a plastic. And this is really, really exciting. And I do research all the time, and I do teaching and different things. But when you're asked to come and talk to a room full of experts about making, that's quite an intimidating thing to do. But I think I've used making, and I've learned a lot from making throughout my scientific career. And it's certainly something that I try and talk about a lot when, when I do this work with schools. So, so we use materials called organic semiconductors. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of them before, but they basically start off with carbon. We can dissolve them in solvents and then print them, just like you print at home. So we can print individual LED pixels, nicely linking to that earlier talk, which you didn't expect. And carbon is great. Carbon is this fantastic, incredibly versatile material. And when you're at school, you guys might remember that you learn about carbon coming in all of these different forms. So you have carbon in pencils, you have carbon in diamonds, you have carbon in plastic bags. But what you think about it is that it's an insulator. And then if any of you kept doing chemistry to kind of higher level, got to your A level, you learned about this funny structure. And benzene doesn't behave like carbon normally does. The electrons don't sit there on each different carbon atom. And I promise the chemistry finishes soon if you're all looking at me like, where is this going to go? So benzene doesn't behave like something normal. Benzene, benzene is not an insulator. It can semiconduct. It can move electrons around. And when I learned this at school, I was like, no way. That's not real. I don't trust you. I don't trust any chemistry teachers. And it wasn't until I got to university and started making things with these materials that I actually appreciated that this has to happen. You know, if you've got an iPhone X, the pixels in that screen are made from organic light emitters. The only way that they can emit light is if there's carbon in there that has this kind of structure. That's the only way it can happen. So my job is to turn something that looks like this into something that looks like this. And we do a whole bunch of making, right? We make experiments. We make stories out of data. We make different kind of optics setups. But we still don't feel, I still don't feel like a maker. And I, I think the reason for that is if you guys think of people right now, who do you think of when you think of a maker? If you think of the word maker, you probably think of white men. So you probably think of the new Singaporean businessman, James Dyson, or someone like Elon Musk, or someone like Bill Gates. And for a really, really long time, makers have been all men, all white, and all incredibly privileged. So all of these people had fantastic, incredible, highly expensive educations. And if I just concentrate on the UK for a second, and you have to bear with me now, but this is the top A-level subjects. So those kind of final years of UK high school, the top A-level subjects are incredibly gendered. The ones that are super important for making at the moment, if we remember that you have to do something like maths and physics to get into university to study engineering, the ones that are top for making, maths, physics, computing, further maths, design technology, they're all dominated by boys. And this really, really bums me out. We're starting off by giving kids, particularly girls, the right, not the right skills to be able to go into these kind of things. And then again, here in the UK, we make kids make their choices so, so early. So at GCSE, you may be able to choose 10 or 11 different subjects. Go to A-level, you can only choose to study three of those. If you're going to study something like engineering, that's probably maths, physics, and further maths, to go on to university to do engineering. That leaves no space for creative thought. That needs no time to develop all of these wonderful things that all of you know are really valuable. And the only way that you can do more of it is if you go to a private school. So again, the only way that you can add more subjects on is if you're incredibly privileged. And then if you can go to university in somewhere like America, you don't have to decide for ages. There's a really fantastic essay. I don't know if any of you have come across this university in America called Olin College. So it's a big engineering school. And they teach engineering in this really great progressive way. And it's all project led. And there's a great engineering professor there called Deb Chakra. And she wrote a great essay on why she wouldn't call herself a maker. And it's because throughout all of history, making and the importance of making has been really, really emphasized and placed on men. You had the Renaissance. I was just in Rome a couple of weekends ago with my dad. And you look around, every museum, every art gallery, every single thing was created by men for other men. And it's, it's such a weird world that we live in. And we put huge value on this technology that predominantly men have created. So if you have an innovation in technology, generally, people will pay more and more and more for it year on year and year. But if you have something where women have dominated, so something like education or healthcare, there's very, very little value there. And people won't pay more for better. And generally, we try and get the cost down. So this has really bummed me out. And actually, as a room full of educators, you probably all know 
that the most important thing to all scientists, including this is Professor Dame Julia Higgins, who's a phenomenal chemical engineer at the university where I work, and the most important thing for all of them is having a really, really inspirational teacher. You know, that's the maker in their life. That's the person who's changed their life. And so this has become really important to me. And so when I was putting this slide together, I was thinking, <laughs> I still don't feel like a maker, but I guess in a whole bunch of ways I am. I make all of these beautiful, incredible crystal structures in our lab that we then use for light emitting diodes. I make sure everyone in our lab is also having a really great time and knows the value of their research and what they contribute to the team. And for the past kind of couple of months or years even, I've been trying really, really hard to get more girls to choose subjects like physics and computer science and design technology so that in the future you don't have that wall of men when you look at it. And it started off with this incredible book that I don't know if any of you read. It's called Inferior by Angela Saini. And it's talking about all of these stereotypes that have historically told men and women what they can and can't do, how terrible the science is behind it, but also how powerful women have been throughout history trying to stand up and fight back. And this book really empowered me, gave me so much confidence. I took it all over the world. Every time I went to a conference, every time I saw an impressive woman talk, I gave them a copy. And, and it's built this incredible network of women and minority scientists everywhere who are trying to change the world. And in one tiny, small way, I've been trying really hard to make the internet less sexist. And this is something that's really important to me because I think when young people live now, they live online. And the content that they get online is incredibly dominated by men. Again, really, again, dominated by men actually from America. So since I read this book and, and was trying really hard to get young girls to think about themselves differently, I've started mass editing Wikipedia. So every single day in 2018, and it started now as well, I've been creating Wikipedia biographies about underrepresented minority scientists and or engineers, sometimes women, sometimes men. But every single day, I've got up to 485 so far, which is pretty cool. And you learn about all of these phenomenal people, right? So all of these people that you should remember and you should tell like, your kids about. So people like Roma Agraral. I don't know if anyone in here has heard of Roma Agraral. She's a structural engineer. She started off as a physicist. She actually went to Imperial to do structural engineering. And then she was the chief engineer for the Shard. So she completely designed and built the top of the Shard. Or Hei An Zhang, who's a head of research at Microsoft and designed this, I've got a little thing that tells you what they've done, designed this phenomenal watch. I don't know if any of you watched that great television program on the BBC called Big Life Fix. But she made a watch that can counter the tremor you get from Parkinson's. So Parkinson's sufferers have this uncontrollable tremor. She made a watch that countered that tremor so that people who are in design or anything could still draw and use their hands. Amazing. My favorite Wikipedia page that I've ever made in all of history is Gladys West, who's an African-American mathematician who was born in the 1930s. And she did all of the early computation and calculations for GPS. And, and I made this page, and she was doing her PhD at the time. This is about half a year ago. And since then, she's been nominated twice for BBC 100 Women. Pretty cool. And she's been inducted into the US Air Force Hall of Fame. And she's finished her PhD. So it's been incredible over the course of this year to learn about all these amazing people. And actually, I've had so much encouragement and enthusiasm for this project that I set up a crowdfunding campaign to get a copy of that book that was so important to me in every state school in the country. And we started one in Canada and New York. And they just got into all of the schools in January. So every single secondary science department state school has got a copy of this book now. So yeah, it's been an amazing journey. And I just want to end with some few thoughts. I think making is incredible. But we really have to make sure it doesn't just end up being for privileged people. And this is kind of my fear with everything. These innovations are great. But who's interacting them? What teachers get to do this? We need to make sure that girls and every single other underrepresented minority know they can access this too. And we really need to celebrate teachers and caregivers because I think they're just as important in all of this. So thank you so much for having me.